Well, again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Two World Podcast. Uh, I will be leading things off today. I am, of course, Barney, and I am joined, as always, today with Jacob. Yes, and um, Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, we hope you are all doing well and staying healthy, and um, we hope that you're excited as we are to listen to another episode. Uh, The new year especially has gotten me thinking about kind of some of the differences that um, I experience here in Japan. You know, one of the main things is how the New Year's is such a big holiday uh, in Japan. So instead of Christmas being such a big deal as I'm used to, um, the New Year's is a very big deal. And um, I didn't really realize that right away. I kind of noticed it even when I was in Thailand. Um, I had to... uh, I actually went on a date with someone um, on Christmas and I thought, wow, it's so interesting that she's asking me on a date on Christmas. Doesn't she want to spend time with her family? Um, and and then I found out that even in Thailand as well, that um, the New Year is a much bigger deal than Christmas. And um, it came around again um, early when I was dating with Ayako and we had... Uh, tickets to go to the all night Disneyland. So on New Year's Eve, Disneyland is open here um, all night long. And it sounded fantastic. You have to, you know, have a lottery for even the chance to buy a ticket. And we were both very excited to go. And it turned out at the last minute that we weren't able to go. And I was really disappointed and having trouble understanding why. And um, Ayako said that her mom wouldn't let her go out and that she had to spend New Year's Eve with her family. And one of the main reasons is there's a certain food that um, I'm not sure exactly why, um, but there is some reason behind this soba, this um, soba noodle, um, um, kind of like a ramen noodle, but made out of buckwheat, I guess. And um, you have to eat this certain soba noodle on New Year's Eve. And and of course, there's a lot of um, kind of traditions around there's certain TV shows and whatnot that take place on that time. But but the noodle itself is um, kind of related to, I would imagine maybe the Shinto tradition um, the, around the New Year. And um, it's very important as 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 they showed me to to have these certain things around New Year's time. And then now later, um, experiencing this again with Ayako and having kids, um, it kind of, with Yuma asking me questions um, about, um, you know, why do, why do people do this or that at the temple? Or, um, you know, why, why do we have this food? Or why do we do this at this time? Um, it made me realize that there's really a lot of, uh, a lot of depth Um, a lot of differences that you wouldn't notice that um, go beyond just being from two different cultures in our family, but also extend to having, um, you know, two different religions or two different kind of views on the same religion um, in your family. And um, Jacob, maybe you also have kind of a similar experience? Definitely. It's interesting comparing our households and our marriages. When I think of being married to Katie, she came from a background that had uh, different traditions than my own. Uh, Her father was Catholic and her mother was Methodist. And from the Catholic side of the family in Cleveland, there was a huge emphasis on St. Patrick's Day because not only um, was the family Catholic, but they also had a big, a large Irish heritage. And so that had a more prominent place than it did in my family, even though we also did have um, some Irish heritage in our family too. And so I remember going several times to Cleveland for the the St. Patrick's Day parade and um, spending time with Katie's dad's side of the family there and thinking, oh, this is interesting how prominent this celebration is. And I enjoyed that. It's nice sometimes to be introduced to a new way of, of thinking about or celebrating a holiday. Uh, and there are lots of, of 
of rich um, exchanges that can happen when you come from different backgrounds. That's the positive side. Um, and you get to be, if you're sharing something from your own tradition, you, you get to present it and share it in a way that you're kind of a host and you, you get to show, I guess you could say, as we've talked about quite a bit, you can show hospitality and, and help the other person come into this um, tradition. Um, but there are also um, times when uh, there can be um, confusing or um, difficult things to understand from the other person's tradition, and it can take time to work through those together. Um, I'm wondering from the standpoint of, of raising children, um, what kind of questions may come up for you from Yuma um, when you know he has both um, the example of, of Ayako's traditions, and then he has examples from your traditions, and what type of questions come up for him as he observes both and I would love to hear about that. Yeah, that's that's tricky for me. Um, I, I don't know, in addition, kind of another layer, I don't know if it's um, my personality or or if it's being American, but, you know, sometimes uh, I think maybe the one um, message that I gave for uh, Palm Sunday, how I kind of showed those illustrations of, you know, what do Americans, how do Americans behave? How do Japanese people behave? And, and a lot of Americans in their illustrations say, you know, well, I think this and I think this and I believe this and, you know, I'm right because of this. And, and the Japanese side was, I wonder if maybe this or, oh, that's interesting. What about this? Um, and so I find myself really having to be careful when I explain things to Yuma, not to say, oh, well, you know, of course, this is the right way, you know, and that other way is just silly. Um, you know, and one example, I think, is, again, you know, around New Year time is when we really notice these things, um, the differences in our religions, because for the most part in Japan, and I, I'm not sure about, well, yeah, I think for Japan, um, I've been to Hong Kong, and I have been to Thailand, or uh, Taiwan, and um, the, the Buddhist people engage with Buddhism much, much more deeply there than what you see here. And um, so for the most part, you know, 367 days out of the year, you don't notice um, the uh, religion in Japan so strongly. But at this time, uh, one thing that we even saw the other day on TV, um, people are going to the shrine and doing um, basically lot, um, getting their fortune by lot. You know, there's a canister with sticks in it and they shake it and then the stick comes out, they get a number and then um, they they compare, they get their fortune, you know, with the corresponding number and and they're ranked by extremely lucky to extremely unlucky. And on this TV show that we're watching, one guy <laughs> got an extremely unlucky one and it said, you know, they, they, they tell about um, travel, job, you know, family. And for travel, it said, you know, whatever you do, don't leave your house this year. And for for family, it said, please, you know, it said, um, expect to get divorced this year. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> right. oh. Yeah, and um, and instead, of, thankfully, instead of keeping these these fortunes, um, you know, there's a tradition of tying them to like either a little tree or something at the temple, you, you leave it behind and then you, you do the lot again and hopefully get a better fortune. And so Yuma asked me about that and it's hard to say exactly, it's hard to explain that because the fact that people get a fortune and then if they don't like it, they just go back and get one again. You, you get the sense that it's not too serious but um, that people are, you know, glad. And when they get a lucky one, they do hang on to it. And so I, I carefully explained that, oh, well, you know, this is the tradition that people like to do. It's it's kind of fun for them, but they do take it somewhat seriously. And, and he thought that that was interesting. Um, another thing that came up for him was talking about heaven. And, um, you know, here, the idea is that there are a number of ceremonies, I think from the Buddhist uh, tradition, a number of ceremonies that you have throughout on certain years after someone passes away, like a year after 
they pass away three years, seven years, and I think all the way up to 49 years after they've passed away. And, and then they, um, they're able to, you know, be in heaven. And, um, he and I were talking about heaven from the Christian point of view. And, um, you know, I was, you know, saying what it's like, you know, from what we read, um, in the Bible in in John and in revelation. And, um, it just happened that one of Iowa's neighbors had passed away, um, or from her parents' neighbors. And I wasn't in the room at the time, but I came into the room and I heard Yuma telling her in Japanese, you know, and, and in heaven, he's like, it's kind of like a big condominium and everyone is living in the same building. And, Aww. and it's just, and he said, and there are all of these trees. And of course, you know, they're in bloom one month out of each, you know, 12 trees and they have all these fruits on them and they're all in bloom throughout the year. And, and it was just so great to hear him kind of comforting her, uh -huh. you know, e e even though, you know, she, she knew the person well, she grew up with that person. And then he was using that as a way to comfort her. Oh, that's really um, sweet. Do that. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Wow. I like how you approach uh, Yuma's questions with a lot of, of care and thought that you want him to be able to take away from what he's exploring, um, things that will help him and bless him. And um, yeah, I really appreciate hearing how you responded. Uh, before we started recording today, we were talking a little bit about um, the importance of family in Japanese culture, particularly even remembering loved ones who have gone on. And um, you had given me an example of um, a baptism at your local church. And I wondered if you'd be willing to talk about that a little bit um, and maybe we can make some connections with um, how even um, the Christian faith, um, when lived in another culture, um, has um, different dimensions and elements that emerge and things like that. So, yeah, it was um, Sugawara san uh, from church when she decided to get baptized, and her husband had passed away already. Um, maybe a few months before then. And um, it turned out that he he had been baptized. Um, I think there was some kind of revival um, in Japan where he was in the area and, and just he attended and and the missionary, um, you know, had an altar call and he went up when he was very young and, um, you know, probably in his teens and, and was baptized at that time. And um, then sugawara san after he passed away decided to get baptized as well and at, at the ceremony she um had his picture in a frame um when whenever we would take kind of a group picture that day she made sure to hold on to his photo as well and i think that this is this is a, a fairly common thing in japanese culture i i i imagine this i'm not sure if it's necessarily related to religion, or if it's maybe related to, um, you know, honoring, honoring uh, family members that have passed away. And yeah, it was, it was nice um, to see that, that, that um, she wanted to make sure that, that he was in the photo as well. And, and I really liked if, if you're, I really liked what you, your point of view that you, um, what you, the insight that you had on that, um, when we talked about this before recording today. Yeah, um, I was sharing with Barney earlier that I have a friend who is Eastern Orthodox. Um, his name is Michael Zebarth, and he actually um, is part of a local monastery here, believe it or not, in Ohio, in Hayesville, called St. Gregory Palamas Monastery. And when I was in seminary at Ashland Theological Seminary, he came and visited our campus, and he talked a little bit with our class on at that time it was a, a class on on uh, ministry and personal spirituality and so he talked about icons and he and he explained how often when uh, a protestant christian views an eastern orthodox person as having an icon in their house or icons in their church um, they view it typically with a little bit of uh, discomfort because um, the orthodox practice uh, when they pray, they also 
what they call venerate the icon, which is that they kiss it, um, they show a sense of respect. And, um, and he said to the Protestant Christian, that looks like almost like they're elevating this picture <laughs> to a level of um, the type of respect or um, or care or, or reverence that we would show towards God. And so that's concerning. Um, but he said for them um, in, his, in their practice of it is much more relational that they understand the icon, which um, the icons are pictures of, of Christians who have gone on to be with the Lord in the past, like well-known individuals. And so um, he says for them, they think of um, how these people are still living in heaven um, in God's presence. And he view, used the word windows. It's like windows into um, into heaven, like a reminder that, that, that these people are still living, they're connected with God. And there's, they are connected also with the person, uh, who is there praying uh, Michael would say, it's just a reminder that they're in heaven, worshiping God and praying just as we are, um, worshiping and praying here. So I thought it was interesting sometimes as, um, and I visited him at the monastery there in Hayesville and he, took me around their place of worship and we talked more. And it's just interesting how from an outsider's perspective, we don't always understand uh, the nuances of, of, a, of a practice. And it might appear just in one sense, ritualistic or, um, but in another sense, if you talk with a person, sometimes there's a deeper, almost emotional relational meaning. And so I kind of wonder if you've encountered that in your um, experiences in, in Japan, as you've learned more about certain practices, it's like, oh, I, at first I thought it was just, you know, a, a route kind of ritualistic thing. And then later I saw there was deeper meaning or, or I guess like the story you just shared about the baptism of Mrs. Sugawara, that um, there was a deep emotional connection for her to bring a picture of her husband. And that's a practice we don't typically see as often, you know, here in, in the West, but um, it had its, a very meaningful place um, in her heart that day. So, yeah. Um, I really liked how you explained that about Sugawara san, that kind of your point of view on that, and that she was maybe thinking that, um, having her husband's photo there was, was kind of a way of thinking that maybe he's, you know, looking down, you know, or joining the, the ceremony from heaven and then even greater to hear about, you know, remembering how, you know, everyone in heaven is really worshiping, um, God, you know, with us as well. I think maybe one thing that I, I didn't quite understand at first in my case was um, the family shrine that um, Ayako's parents have at their house. Um, you know, I, I guess her, her, her grandfather, her dad's dad passed away when she was six. Is that and, Hiro Yoshi? Um, yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yes. And so they have his um, photo there and, um, you know, sometimes they, they put out uh, the grandma, um, you know, his, his, his wife, um, you know, she puts out flowers or she puts out a little snack or something every day and lights some incense. And um, it, it's, I had trouble connecting with it for a while. And then I remember seeing we were at her parents' house. Um, I guess I ran, uh, yeah, for um, when Yuma was um, having his, um, um, you know, he's five. And so there's, there's kind of a ceremony that they have when kids are, when boys are five. And um, so we were, we were there before going to the ceremony and um, Ayako, you know, was dressed up nicely and Yuma was dressed up very nicely. He was wearing a little kimono and um, they were both at the shrine together. This, it, it's just really like, um, um, kind of, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not a shrine, like, it's hard to, to describe, you know, I want to, to people to think that it's some really decorative, you know, thing that is really all out. It's very, very simple. And it just, um, it's kind of almost like a chest of drawers with, with his photo on top and, um, you know, a place for incense and whatnot and, and a bell. And, um, Ayako was kind of guiding Yuma through it and, just seeing how they were both kind of really attentive and, um, you know, taking it very seriously. Um, it's nice in, in, in a way that it also, um, you can see how much 
uh, her grandfather meant to her, even only, you know, knowing him for about six years of her life and, and having that kind of reminder of him. And, and even, you know, sometimes um, when there's birthdays, they put a slice of birthday cake there. And, and of course, the grandma eats it later. But um, <laughs> it's just kind of the same way with the photo, you know, having a, a sense of the family member is, is kind of still with them in a way. I remember when I was able to visit with you there in Japan during my sabbatical, we went to your in-laws home. And before we left, Ayako's father showed me that area. Mm -hmm. And he said something to me that was very interesting. And I think it was, it went like this. He said, for us, we know that some people will go to a cemetery and will remember their loved one who's gone on. But we like to also have a place in our home and remember them and keep that in our home. Mm -hmm. And when he explained it that way, I thought, oh, that's interesting because we do go to cemeteries and place flowers there and remember and share stories. And um, what I heard him saying is um, for us to have a place like that in our home is very meaningful. And um, I appreciate him taking time to explain that because I, I didn't quite understand myself what it meant and, um, or the significance that it had for him. But does that sound, did, did I hear him correctly? Is that kind of the sense that you get to from the. Yeah, I think, for him? I think for sure. I think um, more than, more than, I, I think, of course, there's kind of a religious meaning to it, of course, and, and maybe other cultures place a much stronger emphasis on it. But I think, yeah, it's more, of a, a memorial, um, kind of a way of, you know, really keeping that person, their memory, you know, really strong with the family. Yeah, I think the way the way you um, reported it, I think it's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I wonder too, as you've lived longer in, um, in Japan and learn more about how to um, to uh, be present and navigate and, and experience different holidays and, um, and do it with your family. Um, and you've had a, more opportunities for conversations. I, I kind of wonder if you flip the question and look at it from Ayako's perspective and the journey that maybe she's had, I know it's hard to speak for her, but maybe some things come to mind. Like, have you noticed times where she's asked you questions about your a Christian faith or certain traditions you've done or elements of, of how you live your faith life that um, have piqued interest from her. And can you remember any examples of that and what those conversations were like? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering too, trying to think here. Um, it, it was, it was very nice that um, after we got married and, and we're living um, near to the Echio church, she would go to church with me um, every week um, when she was able. And then um, when we moved to Narita, then soon we had Yuma and it was harder for her to go. Um, and and I'm, I'm always appreciative that she is happy when, um, or, you know, when I, I pray before meals and, and things like that. And um, uh, I think that I remember before Christmas, I was kind of keeping the tradition in our family that my dad started of reading from Luke two before um, opening presents. And um, in this, this case, we were reading from a children's Bible that um, Kimiyaki sensei actually gave us. And so it's bilingual and it's in um, you know Japanese and English. And she, she didn't necessarily ask anything but she really seemed to appreciate the story and maybe it helped her to understand the story better. And, and I know we have read from that Bible a few times and, and she's kind of used it as a way to practice um, uh, hiragana, reading hiragana with Yuma. And, and I do get the sense that, that she is understanding better, a little, a little bit more about the Bible. But I don't know that she has, I can't think exactly of anything offhand. I 
think she's had a few questions here or there, maybe, maybe about communion. Um, and I think she asked me um, about saints um, and that tradition a few times. Um, maybe when she hears something from another person's experience of living abroad or, or something she sees on TV, then she's happy to ask me. Um, actually, another thing that just came to mind is people send uh, New Year's cards uh, in Japan. And she has one friend who married um, someone from Kazakhstan, and he is um, Muslim. And they they never use in their New Year's cards, they always send them later, and they never use the certain Japanese phrases that that most people use. And she, she asked me, she wondered if maybe that was related to um, maybe that maybe her husband's tradition. And, and so it's in kind of maybe when, when she sees things happen, maybe outside of our family, that she realizes are connected, maybe with with um, Christianity or, or other Western religions or other religions that aren't um, Buddhism or Shinto, then then I think she she likes to ask me about my opinion on those things. Oh, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing. One thing I wondered as you were talking is um, about the time that you visited Worcester Mennonite and there was the dedication for Yuma. And I'm kind of wondering leading up to that, um, if she had any questions or if her parents had any questions because they were able to be present for that. And I was wondering maybe how you explained um, what that um, event would signify, you know, from the viewpoint of, of your home church and for you. And I'm, I'm real fascinated by that. Yeah, I think in this way, there's kind of an overlap um, in, in Japan at um, the, f the first month, the first 40 days, I think, after the child is born, then people take the child to the, um, the shrine and um, make little offerings at, um, at the shrine and kind of the other smaller shrines around that are part of the bigger shrine. Um, and so it was nice to be able to connect that with, to, it was easier to explain the idea of a dedication by connecting it to that um, tradition. Um, I remember that that was right, that was at Christmas, and it was harder to um, kind of explain uh, the Christmas Eve service that time. And I, I was really working hard to kind of translate, you know, everything that was going to be said. And um, Ayako had the idea that maybe just giving them, you know, a, a better, a, a real, maybe general idea of the Christmas story would be more meaningful for them, you know, easier to understand. Um, and, and yeah, they, I think that was the one when um, there were the sand sculptures or illustrations that the person was doing. And, and they really appreciated that, you know, even though they didn't, you know, I didn't translate, you know, word for word, what was being said, just the little, um, information that they had about what Christmas is about. And even her dad, who sometimes is a very quiet person, he really went on and on about how meaningful and, and interesting and just it, the service was, it really made an impact on him at that time. And it was just, yeah, the whole trip um, was fantastic. And especially the um, Christmas Eve service and the Christmas service, it was so great that they could be a part of that. Oh, that's wonderful. I remember that specific year. And that was a, a very special program with the sand art and how it related to the story. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that they were there for that one. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really neat. Well, I wanted to share one more story with you. And this goes back to my wife's family in Cleveland, and her father who grew up Catholic. Um, his name is Ed. Uh, we were visiting one time the cemetery for his mother, um, Katie's grandma. And we were there by the space reflecting. He was sharing some stories. And I think maybe they had tended to the grave a little bit. And then we had a prayer time. And then I remember him talking to his mom directly, um, like saying something along the lines of, well, mom, as you look down from heaven, you see us know we're thinking about you and 
that really caught my attention because in my childhood home, like our practice of prayer, we would remember loved ones who had gone on and with fun, with meaningful stories. And we would, you know, think about seeing them again in heaven someday, but we didn't typically talk to them directly. Um, and it made me think a little bit of my experience in high school. I went to a Catholic high school and learning about their um, understanding of the communion of saints, that through Jesus, we are connected uh, not only to one another here uh, on earth um, right now in, in our uh, relationship with Jesus, but also connected through Jesus to those who have gone on before us and are in heaven with, with, with God. And so there's this idea of, of, of a robust sense of connection, of interconnectedness, of um, being related and held together through Jesus. And so I, I thought, oh, wow, like he, for him, he still feels that deep sense of connection with his mom so much so that he might even speak and, and it might, he might have a sense that God would let her hear that somehow, or that it would bless him to be able to say that. And so it was, it was not until years later that my own mom passed away that I had a few experiences that made me think about this more. Uh, we went to a water park in Sandusky, Ohio called Kalahari. And um, it was a type of event where we brought our kids and they were having a lot of fun. And my, my mom would have loved it. She loved spoiling her grandkids and, um, and being there for the excitement and bringing lots of fun, uh, little toys and, and good food and snacks to eat. And I had a dream about her. And she said to me in the dream, she said, Jacob, enjoy it, just enjoy it. And she didn't say in the dream what it was, but I woke up right after that dream because um, it was really, I was really excited to see her in the dream. And when I woke up, I still had that feeling of like, ah, oh, like that was so nice to have that dream. And then I, when I woke up, I thought just right away, the first thought that came to my mind is enjoy this, this time with family at this water park. She would have wanted that so much. Um, and I had um, a second experience that um, was very special a day or two after our third child, Hannah was born, um, I was driving back and my mom had wanted to meet Hannah and she passed mm -hmm. away just about a mm -hmm. month before Hannah was born. And uh, I was driving back home and getting some items and then coming back to the hospital. And on my way back to the hospital, um, I had this, um, this picture, mental image come into my mind of my parents smiling. And I heard like, and I say, I heard, I didn't hear audibly, but I had this sense in my mind of, of, of God speaking these words, behold, I make all things new. And it was as if in that moment, I thought of the birth of Hannah, this new life coming into our family as a, an expression of God's healing, the grief of the loss mm -hmm. of my mom. And that mm -hmm. was God making all things new for me and for Katie and for our family. And so it was a very powerful moment where I felt so connected to my parents and, mm -hmm. um, and to my mom who had gone on before. So all that to say that you, I feel I've learned so much just in mm -hmm. um, knowing um, some different ways of approaching prayer and, and, and um, spirituality from being married to my wife, Katie and her family. And it sounds to me like you've learned a number of things too in in your family and your time with Ayako and that's beautiful and it doesn't mean that there aren't challenges and times where we as spouses have to negotiate differences and find um, ways that honor you know both of our backgrounds and try to you know forge a healthy environment now with our families we combine um, you know our experiences um, but at the same time there's a lot of richness there to enjoy mm -hmm. and um, and I wonder um, before we close if you had any mm -hmm. uh, final thoughts or things that have come to you yeah just that that last story of yours is just so amazing and remarkable and just such a clear reminder how you know God is the God of all things and um, that that we um, you know, maybe we get too used to looking for God in certain ways. And um, when we can really see, especially by seeing different people practicing 
um, living their life of faith in a different way. And we can see you know, God in those ways too, and um, speaking to us and, and how we can use that as an opportunity to, um, to learn more ourselves and then later share that um, with those around us too. And I just loved hearing those two stories. That was just amazing. Oh, thank you so much, Barney. And that's a great insight that you shared there too about um, being open to learn and to grow. And we want to thank our listeners for coming along with us on this journey today. And we hope that you too, in your own experience with perhaps being in a family where there are other family members who have a different background than you, or just in your own experience with your friendships and with others that you met, that you can have uh, reflections and, and positive lessons and insights as well in these areas. And if you'd like to share any of those with us, please feel free to um, comment on uh, either our YouTube page or um, in any of our podcast presences. And um, we look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, goodbye.